Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. As I pointed out in an earlier message, Luke is not so much interested in chronology as bringing together certain stories about Jesus. And in this long chapter, which has quite a number of uh, uh, great paragraphs, in fact, I think there are 13 paragraphs uh, in the chapter, and I'll seek to comment on every one. But it's very interesting that in the first 36 verses, there are some alternating truths, uh, first, third, and fifth uh, uh, statements are about the disciples being sent on a missionary tour and then 5,000 miraculously fed and then the disciples are called to follow the way of the cross. And in between those statements, there are things about the Lord Jesus himself. So on the one hand, we have Jesus, and on the other hand, we have what he is intending to do in the ministry of the kingdom. Now, in the... Uh, uh, Gospel of John, we are told that one of the incidents in this chapter, namely the feeding of the 5,000, took place at the Passover. And uh, then in the uh, chapter 6 of John and verse 4, he shows that the cross came exactly a year later at the, or that's in the 12th chapter and verse 1 of John rather, uh, that the Passover feast where Jesus was crucified uh, took place. Here, uh, Luke doesn't develop uh, history. He brings together the, these stories that are really speaking of the church and the kingdom. You'll notice that in verse 2, uh, that the uh, that the scripture uh, in 11, uh, verse 2 rather, uh, that the disciples were sent out to preach the kingdom. Uh, and uh, here in this great chapter, uh, the apostles are to preach the kingdom of God, which is now taking pl the place of the Old Testament kingdom. You remember that Jesus said earlier in Luke that the least in this kingdom, the kingdom of God, was greater than John the Baptist, which is an amazing statement. But that's because John was coming to the end of what the, we might call the kingdom of God uh, using Israel. Now the kingdom of God is being uh, preached first by the apostles, uh, and then uh, by those of us who are not distinctly apostles. You remember in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43, at the end of the parable of the tenants, that Jesus said this amazing statement, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And so the Lord Jesus is initiating his kingdom and uh, we are replacing uh, 
the children of Israel as a nation who were supposed to get the gospel out right from the very beginning, but uh, they did not. And so the Lord is now instituting uh, a new kingdom, and we, his disciples, are to get the word out on his behalf. And what Luke is doing here, he's speaking both of Jesus and us. Remember in Galatians chapter 6 and uh, verse 16, it says, uh, And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And it's my opinion that we are now the Israel of God and the disciples of the Lord Jesus. In the second paragraph, we have thoughts about the Lord Jesus, not us, uh, and it's Herod who sought to see Jesus because he had uh, was, in a sense, uh, he got a guilty conscience because of putting John the Baptist uh, to death, and now he was wondering whether John had been raised from the dead. And uh, people, of course, were saying that Elijah had appeared and uh, one of the old prophets had appeared. He wanted to know who Jesus really was. And uh, then in the uh, third paragraph, we find the disciples were given the job of feeding the multitude. So can you see this alternation, who Jesus is, and then what we as the disciples are to do? Because although Jesus made the miracle, guess what? He used his disciples to distribute the bread and the fish, just as now he has begun the gospel, he has died on the cross, he has been raised from the dead and he has ascended up on high, and now he's giving us the job. Then in the fourth uh, paragraph, we have this amazing experience uh, when uh, Peter is uh, to make a confession that Christ is God. Of course, we all know that the word Christ is the Greek word for the Jewish or the Hebrew word uh, Messiah, and our English word is anointed. So there are three uh, words in different languages to describe the Messiah, Messiah, anointed, uh, and Christos, Christ. And Peter, when he is asked who Jesus is, says these words. Peter answered, the Christ of God. And interestingly enough, at this point, Jesus strictly charged them, verse 21, and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. We all know that the Jews were hoping for a Messiah that would throw off the Roman yoke and set up uh, a special kingdom for the Jews to rule over everybody in the world. Jesus didn't want this to take place, of course, because as he is to say to Pilate a little later on, uh, his kingdom was not of this world. And so for this reason, while the disciples were really understanding, or at least Peter was, speaking for the other disciples, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ of God, 
don't tell anyone yet, because, as Jesus says, uh, in the midst of this amazing moment, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, not accepted, but rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Now, he's speaking of himself there, and in the next paragraph, we find in verses 21, uh, we, we found in 21 and 22 that uh, uh, he is to be rejected and don't tell people, but then we find that uh, in the next paragraph, paragraph 6, which, ex which uh, goes from verses 23 to 27, we find discipleship. Here again, this alternation. This is who Jesus is. Now, this is what you're supposed to do. And what uh, we are commanded to do, uh, and notice he said to all, verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? I was talking to a teacher from a Christian school recently, and uh, a Sikh millionaire had sent his son to this school knowing that he would get a good education. And of course, in the Christian school, they asked the students to memorize scripture and to go home and uh, go over the scripture with their parents. Well, the Sikh millionaire doesn't want his son to become a Christian, but he does want him to have good marks. Guess what? He said to his son, if you get good marks and don't become a Christian, I'll buy you a Lamborghini. I don't know how many thousands of dollars it costs for a Lamborghini, but some of you would know. Uh, some of you might even aspire to having one. But here is a young man who is to put on the scales a Lamborghini or the words, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. For I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Some people who actually were there were to live to see the kingdom of God coming. Now, theologians and scholars have discussed all these things and uh, as to what is referred to uh, as the coming of the kingdom of God. And there are, at least I've understood, seven different interpretations given as to when the kingdom of God came. Uh, one of the uh, interpretations is uh, that it's the transfiguration that is to follow in the next paragraph. Um, there are also those, and I tend to agree with this, that uh, the kingdom of God was seen to come in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed and the sacrificial system was finally over. Because the kingdom of God is not only the blessings that we experience as Christians, 
but there is also uh, a judgment that will inevitably come at the end uh, of the age when the kingdom of God will be fully realized. I have come to uh, love the thought that uh, expressed in the little aphorism, now, not yet. The kingdom of God is now, but it's not yet fully consummated, but it's going to the place where, as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, the Lord Jesus will deliver the kingdom to the Father when he has conquered everything, including Satan and death. Now, in paragraph 7, we have the transfiguration, and Jesus had spoken earlier in verses 21 and 22 uh, of death, uh, crucifixion, uh, rejection by the elders, and uh, to rise again on the third day. Now we find about the eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James, those special three, and he went up to the mountain, notice this, to pray. And we, when we, for instance, look at the present situation of uh, the virus that is affecting the world, what we need to be doing is what Jesus was doing here, and that is praying. Not necessarily that we will be spared from it, but praying that we will be united with the Lord Jesus uh, as we go through these trials, even should it be that some of us will actually cross the river of death. Uh, and we can know, as uh, David knew in uh, Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, and thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, anointed my head with oil, my cup runs over. Even now, that is happening. Jesus prayed, and uh, we know that uh, he was visited by two amazing Old Testament characters, Moses and Elijah, and they talked to him about his death. And this is very important because as the letter to the Romans reminds us, the gospel of the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus was witnessed by the law Elijah, uh, Moses and the prophets Elijah. So the great representatives of the Old Testament, Elijah and Moses, are here speaking of the death of the Lord Jesus and its great impact that it has to have uh, upon the world. Um, it's very interesting that Moses was the instrument of delivering the Jews from slavery in Egypt, and now he's speaking with the Lord Jesus, who is to deliver not only the Jews, but the Gentiles too, from the bondage of sin. And so in one sense, just as there is a new kingdom, there's a new exodus. And uh, uh, a cloud, we read, uh, comes down uh, in the uh, great moment of the transfiguration. And uh, we have the Lord Jesus clothed in dazzling white showing his deity, and uh, these two men appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. The focus now 
is on the death of the Lord Jesus. And Peter and the three who were with him, uh, and those who were with him rather, uh, were heavy with sleep for some reason. But when they became fully awake, uh, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were put it, parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And not knowing what he said, he was just confused and amazed at what he was seeing. But what he wanted to do was soon silenced by this glorious saying that came from heaven. A cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud and a voice, here it is, a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. You remember that the baptism of Jesus, the father had said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, which was a combination of two verses from the Old Testament from Psalm 2 and Isaiah uh, combined together. This is my beloved son uh, in whom my soul delights, in whom I am well, well pleased. And then we find after God had said to these people, listen to Jesus. And we might uh, take from that that that's what our business is as we contemplate him this morning the glorious Son of God, the Messiah, the crucified, risen, ascended, uh, and glorified Lord Jesus, we listen to him as we hear his voice through the scriptures that he has uh, given to us. Here he is, therefore, uh, in the cloud, as in Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34 there was another great moment exodus chapter 40 and verse 34 as i turn to it here and as you turn to it no doubt if you are listening with your bibles uh, open exodus 40 and 34, when the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And now the glory of the Lord, Jesus, is filling the that uh, hill and uh, we have this glorious experience that we can only imagine, but the imagination of it is uh, glorious. And then in the uh, ninth uh, paragraph, guess what? There's more teaching on Jesus' death. While the people marveled and were astonished, Verse 43, all were astonished at the majesty of God because Jesus had cast out this uh, evil spirit. But they did not fully understand and they were too proud to acknowledge fully who Jesus really is. In paragraph 12, we find an unusual route through Samaria. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, Jesus was rejected by the Samaritans, but that didn't stop him from going through Samaria 
uh, as even though he is rejected in many areas today, he still seeks to reach the people with the gospel as we uh, let people know what he has done and who he is. Again, see how much, although they did not understand the saying, verse 45, that the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, they didn't understand, so, uh, and it was concealed from them. Uh, God had not uh, uh, determined that they should fully understand what was going, but once it had been done and the Holy Spirit was given, then they understood completely what was going on. Now, in paragraph 12, as I have said, there is this great uh, moment where he, it says that uh, because they rejected him, Peter, uh, uh, John and James wanted to bring fire down from heaven, but he turned, verse 50, Five and rebuked them, uh, and we know from looking at this at other in another place that uh, he says, "You don't know what manner of spirit you are of. Uh, I've come to save people, not to send fire down from heaven." And he continues to appeal to those even who object. Uh, reject him. In the final paragraph, Jesus again comes back to us and what it costs. And he says, as they were going on along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes of holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. And he said, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. It wasn't that Jesus was lacking in compassion. It was that he saw and sees in us whether we are truly sincere, whether we really want to serve him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, or whether it's all outward show. In these stories, what Luke has done is he wants us to hear Jesus and obey Jesus. But the ground defended are the death and resurrection. He's not trying to please God by works, but recognizing his death and resurrection as the ground of forgiveness and salvation. That's our position. And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I have had already inscribed on a, a bronze plaque that will go on the, my grave is happy if with my latest breath I might but gasp his name, preach him to all, and cry in death, behold, behold the Lamb. May that be our testimony in the name of Jesus. Amen.